Hello and welcome back to the Prehistoric Aquarium. So, over the last few weeks we have been tracing the evolution of land animals from the Devonian and into the Permian. But before we prepare to move on to the Mesozoic, this week we're going to check in on our aquatic creatures to see how they're doing during this strange transition as we reach the end of the Paleozoic. I'm actually going to start this time by checking up their relationships on the screen now, because last time I sort of built up the tree as we went along to sort of build up suspense, I guess, but this one's actually a bit trickier, so don't worry if this makes zero sense right now, we'll keep coming back to it as we go. We're going to start off very quickly with my beloved armoured jawless fish. This fish started out in the Ordovician and Silurian and massively diversified in the Devonian about 420 million years ago. They were the first animals to evolve dermal bone, but they haven't evolved jaws yet, they are jawless. But they do have this external bony armour, it's made up of different plates composed mainly of dentin and enamel, materials that we have since inherited from them today, forming the roots and crowns of our teeth. Today there are only a handful of living jawless fish species, uh, like hagfish and lampreys, which are super yucky and slippery compared to their armoured precursors. However, back in the Silurian and early Devonian, jawless fishes like Osteostracans and Thelodonts vastly outnumbered early jawed fishes. It wasn't until the mid to late Devonian that the tables turned and the jawed vertebrates came to dominance, a dominance that they still hold to this day. Jawed vertebrates, or nathostomes as we call them, they include the bony fish, which also includes every other tetrapod that we've covered in the last few episodes, as well as the cartilaginous fish, so that's sharks as well basically. And the Devonian also saw the diversification of other now extinct jawed vertebrates like acanthodians and placoderms. For the longest time we really weren't sure what happened here, why were the jawless fish replaced? Well, recent evidence by some wonderful colleagues at Manchester found really solid evidence that an increase in predators may have driven away the jawless fish, and not just from their typical predators like our Eurypterids, but they mainly found bite marks from early jawed fish as well, which is really interesting. The point I'm getting at, to give you some context, is before we even reach the Permian, jawed fish rule the seas and other aquatic ecosystems. So let's go through some new examples of new jawed fish that have just been added to the mod. We'll start with our placoderms, they were extremely diverse, and we already have a large display of placoderms from the last series, but there was always one notable absence, and I had a quick look at it, and this tank is just way too small for it to be honest, it's been too small for our poor Titanicus for ages, so before we continue the story we're going to have to make some pretty extreme alterations to the aquarium layout. First of all we're going to move the Xenacanthus tank, they're kind of in the way, it's a stupid spot for them. Alright, so I've moved the Xenocanthus tank over here against this wall, and it's actually worked out quite well as I can sort of squeeze in another window over here into the uh, main shark tank, which also lets you go onto the balcony, which is quite cool. But now we've got this massive space out here, and given how big some of these animals are, we're going to need it. And we're going to try a bit of a radical approach to clearing out some of this land. In the last series, I pointed out that I've not really been to an aquarium before. This building is based more on museums that I've been to than aquariums. But a few weeks ago, I went to Valencia in Spain for a conference and we went to visit the aquarium. Or actually, technically, it's an oceanarium because they had beluga whales, which I didn't know was possible or legal, to be completely honest. It was really shocking to see them. It was very strange, but anyway, the whole time I was there, I was making loads of mental notes for the prehistoric aquarium, so this next tank is very heavily inspired by the Beluga enclosure in Valencia. And this is what I've come up with. In Valencia, it's actually more of a complete ring. What I've just done here is built like a quarter of it, essentially, and I've added all the usual flourishes that the rest of the aquarium has, like this lovely walkway over the top. I'm quite pleased with it. And then, like in Valencia, uh, we've got a lower area down here. It's all connected to the other areas. Very happy. So to jump back to our story, anyway, the most famous placoderm that's been missing until now is of course Dungleosteus, which just looks awesome. By now I'm sure most of you know what a Dungleosteus is, it's the huge Devonian predator with a bear trap for a face, but something I don't think I've seen in a video game before, or even a documentary. The creators of this mod haven't depicted its bony plates as external armour, but as an internal skull instead. Dunkleosteus is known only from its skull, the remainder of their bodies have never been found preserved. This body shape that we give them is actually just that of Cocosteus scaled up and adjusted slightly. But almost every reconstruction of a Dunkleosteus gives them this frightening exoskeletal armour, but I've noticed a very recent trend among a few paleo artists 
to give them this more fleshy, presumably cartilaginous face instead. And that's what they've gone for here. It's quite shark-like. In fact, it's almost sort of cetacean-like, sort of whale-like, because we're fairly confident that large placoderms would have had soft skin, not, you know, scaly skin. So it makes sense that they would have a fleshy face like this as well. But in all honesty, and I hate to admit this, I don't know where this trend started. If anyone knows, please tell me, because like, I've never come across some amazing paper about new fossil evidence that supports this look, but at the same time, I've not seen anything that disproves it either. By this I mean, no one has published on, say, the micro textures in the bony plates that would tell us if they were underneath skin or not. Does that make sense? Either way, this is still a very sensible and valid reconstruction, and given how rarely external bone crops up in living animals, especially fish, it makes perfect sense, and it's something I'd like to see more examples of, in all honesty. But in my personal, probably flawed opinion, I think the true appearance of Dunkleosteus is probably a bit more of an in-between. Placoderms do have a surprising amount in common with bony fishes, not just sharks, and in a lot of living bony fish you can still sort of see the shape of their bony plates expressed at the surface, even they have so much bone in their head. I don't know. Anyway, very long ramble short, I really like this reconstruction. Nothing I've just said is in any way a criticism of this model. I genuinely think it looks fantastic, and at this resolution, like come on, you can't really complain, it looks phenomenal. So as I was saying before, living fish diversity, their species are really imbalanced, right? We just said that today jawed vertebrates massively outnumber jawless vertebrates, and that's really because of the bony fishes. 98% of jawed vertebrates are bony fish, that's insane. Meanwhile, the other major group of jawed vertebrates, the cartilaginous fish, well they just have about less than a thousand species, so what happened there? Why is it so imbalanced now? Thing is, when jawed vertebrates sort of, you know, came to power in the Devonian as it were, the cartilaginous fish were right in the thick of it. They were so successful at that time. It wasn't until the Permian when their numbers started to decline, but in the late Devonian, and especially the Carboniferous, cartilaginous fish were the most successful vertebrate group in the world, which is weird to imagine when today we think of them as these mysterious and elusive creatures. I mentioned in a previous video as well that one of the biggest misunderstandings when it comes to cartilaginous fishes is that we often think of them as these very primitive living fossils, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Look at it this way, cartilaginous fish have skeletons that are made of cartilage, making them completely different to pretty much every other vertebrate alive today. Okay, well vertebrates still have a little bit of cartilage, like if you go waggle your earlobe, that soft stuff in there, that's, that's cartilage. Now this does admittedly make their fossil record a bit of a goddamn nightmare as cartilage is barely preserved compared to proper bone and teeth, but it's still an amazing adaptation if you want to be a fast moving, maneuverable predator. But that's just it, a skeleton made of cartilage is an adaptation, so even though jawless fish evolved their external dermal bone, their internal skeletons were still made of cartilage. Same goes for placoderms, they have this big bony head but often the rest of their skeletons are again cartilage. But sharks and their relatives, they evolved from an animal with what we call endochondral bone, the same type of bone that you can find in bony fishes. Which means that sharks gained the option to have a proper mineralized skeleton and then went, nah, <laughs> and specialized in a cartilaginous skeleton instead, but in a new and innovative way. They are not primitive, they are actually very adaptive specialists. Now, modern cartilaginous fishes are divided into two groups. First, we have the infamous Elasmobranchs, which include sharks and rays and skates. We already have a couple extinct Elasmobranchs, and we have a new one from the Carboniferous the chicken here. So this is Bandringa? Bandringia? Oh, go ahead, Bandringa, yeah. And this animal should feel very at home in the prehistoric aquarium, because it's from the Maison Creek. This is a locality in Illinois, which is the same place where our Tully monster and our Platosomus and a bunch of other specimens here can be found. We've mentioned before that the preservation at the Maison Creek is really interesting. Their fossils are contained in these amazing concretions that you can just sort of crack open and find all sorts of wonderful things. And what's extra interesting is that there is a disproportionate number of Bandringia juveniles and egg casings found there, suggesting that the locality was a sort of nursery or like a shark spawning ground, which is just lovely to think about. And they've got this great little paddlefish-like snout too, which has just been recreated perfectly. But the cartilaginous fishes also include the pretty obscure holocephalans, which today only include the chimeras. But back in the Paleozoic, 
This group included loads of different weird and wonderful creatures, many of which we actually already have here, but again we have some new examples from the Permian which we're now going to add. First up we have Manaspis, which is an awesome fossil that highlights its little whiskers and scoots, which is extra interesting because modern holocephalons tend to be, I guess what we call like naked, as in that they didn't have any scales or tough ornamentation like that, but this again just looks so amazing. The effort put into these obscure creatures is awesome. Next up we have Janassa, and they belong to a group of extinct holocephalans called the Petalodontiforms, same as, uh, where is it, Balancy over here from the last series. Their fossil record is it's pretty nasty. They're mainly known from their teeth or just these big splats of fishy mush, so as you can imagine, because of that, their relationships are very poorly known. In fact, just look at how different these two animals are, it's very, very possible that in the not too distant future, someone will just dismantle this group entirely, or at least remove Janessa because it is so different. And we also have Anioptrix, and I'm really excited to see how they move, because for a long time it was believed that Anioptrix was a flying fish. Now scientists have studied the aspect ratio of their fins to their body, the diagrams by the way are both hilarious and terrifying, and we're sadly pretty confident that Anioptrix could not glide. It still has some really cool fins though. However, I have some very exciting news for you. This is a fossil of Potanichthys, and it's a ray-finned fish from the early Triassic, and it is the oldest flying fish. But get this, this animal evolved before pterosaurs, before birds, and well before bats. So, even though Anioptrix kind of lets us down a bit, fish were still the first vertebrates to technically fly. That, I think, of all the paleofacts I know, that is probably my favourite. Now I do have, annoyingly, a really fun fact about Anioptrix, but I can't tell you yet because the embargo hasn't lifted on this research, but when it does I promise we'll come back to it. Sorry about that. Anyway, by far the most famous extinct holocephalon has got to be Helicoprion, and for this guy we're going to need to head back to our brand new big fish tank. If they've done a remarkable job of recreating this animal, it looks perfect, it's not a ridiculous saw blade monster like you'll see in other games, it looks like a genuine animal, probably more than any other Helicoprion I've ever seen in any other game. So as you may know, this animal is primarily known only from its tooth wall, and there's been this almost unending debate about what the rest of the animal looked like, including some really ridiculous interpretations of this out of control spiral of teeth. But actually nowadays we have a pretty good idea of how this tooth wall would sit in its mouth thanks to some really exceptional fossils and also fossils of its relatives as well, and even distantly related fish that have convergently evolved a similar setup as well, like some of which are actually in our aquarium. Now we've been talking about this dichotomy between the elasmobranchs, the very sharky creatures, and the holocephalans, which so far just look so random and so strange, and you may be wondering sort of what is it that makes Helicoprion a holocephalon? Because in a lot of reconstructions, including this one, it just looks like a big shark. Well, this was actually a huge thing, and for the longest time people thought it was a shark. But a paper in 2013 CT scanned the best preserved tooth wall that we have, and found that its jaw attached to the rest of its skull much more like a holocephalon than an elasmobranch. And that's something you'd never be able to tell just by looking at the fossil remains. It's crazy just how much one little bit of CT scanning can reveal extra information that rewrote this animal's biology. This is why not only is finding new fossils important, but it is so extra important to try and use these new modern techniques on fossils that we've got lying around, which is what I do as part of my research on admittedly less exciting animals, but it's really remarkable what you can find. Anyway, I am way over time today, oh no, um, that's what happens when I talk about fish I guess, so <laughs> let's wrap this up. I think our creatures look pretty happy in here, even though animals like this tend not to do too well in captivity, like at all, I think animals like this need pretty big enclosures and you know, they come from vast habitats, so if this was real I don't think it'd last long I'm afraid, it'd probably die in a bit. Uh, speaking of which, <laughs> we've once again reached the end of the Permian, just in time for the great dying. In the end Permian mass extinction, around 95% of all marine life was wiped out. But a lot of the animals we've just discussed, including Helicoprion, appear to have gone extinct billions of years before then. Like I said earlier, before the end of the Permian, cartilaginous fishes were already on a big decline, and were actually only just coming to terms with the possibility of how this happened 
and whether or not it even did happen, because it's also possible that this time period is just really undersampled. There's a huge limit in our understanding, and part of that comes from which parts of the world tend to be investigated by paleontologists for. Usually countries in Europe and North America. In fact, I'm pretty sure I remember seeing a paper once. This has nothing to do with Fermion and Fish or anything, but there is actually considerable data that suggests that there are more fossils found in proximity to a car park or a pub. And that is a crazy bias that <laughs> we're gonna have to deal with one day. That about wraps us up. Um, next episode we'll do a bit of a wrap up again, so we'll name some more creatures. You left some amazing names in, in the last video, so we'll do that. We'll address some of your comments if you have any other questions or more names. Now is the chance to put them in the comment section. Also, and I, I don't like asking this, but we're super close to 2,000 subscribers and a bunch of you who watch these videos aren't subscribed. I know because I've seen the YouTube analytics. Um, so if you wanted to do that and be our 2,000 subscriber, that'd be pretty good. Um, anyway, I'm over time now, so bye!